Hello, everybody. Good evening and a warm welcome to you wherever in the world uh, that you are joining us from. My name is Christine Mundwa, and I'm going to be facilitating our virtual digital panel uh, this evening. Uh, we are gathered to ask the question, zero hunger, uh, zero chance, excuse me, for zero hunger. This year, 2021, was a real pivotal year. That is because if you look at the clock, we are just 10 years away to achieving the ambitious goals that we set out at a UN level uh, to achieve by 2030. Yes, I am referring to the Sustainable Development Goals, what you might refer to as the SDGs. Now, one of those SDGs, specifically SDG number two, was zero hunger. The ambition that we had back in 2015 was that by 2030, we would have no more hunger in the world. But as we sit here today, ladies and gentlemen, wherever in the world you are, we can attest that the world is not on track to achieving that goal. And to make matters worse, we find ourselves in a pandemic, a pandemic that's really erased many of the gains that we had made over the years, because what this pandemic has done, coronavirus COVID, is it is, exacerbating the issues around nutrition. The people who were vulnerable to begin with are even more vulnerable today. I do want to quote a number and I hope that this is something that will really be food for thought as we engage in this conversation. Between 720 and 811 million people in the world faced hunger in the year 2020. Now, that was an increase of 161 million compared to the year before. What these numbers are telling us really is just the pandemic has had an impact in terms of what we're able to do when it comes to achieving a world of zero hunger, a world where nobody goes to bed hungry. Now, we're going to be discussing today the impacts that climate change as well is having on the situation, how climate change is affecting and impacting nutrition around the world. Ladies and gentlemen, um, most of you will know that we've been brought together here by Action Against Hunger, Action Gegen den Hunger, uh, Save the Children, Global Citizen, as well as Welt Hungerhilfe. Uh, these are our partners today and of course, we are going to be engaging in this conversation with four panelists. Uh, I'll be joined and you can see them alongside me by the screen and I quickly want to introduce them to you um, and I will get into their descriptions a little later. Uh, and as I say your name, my dear panelists, perhaps you can wave because you will not be speaking uh, at this stage. Esther Lupafaya is joining us from Malawi as is Mike Kunga. Uh, who was also in Malawi, and uh, I'm happy and pleased to say that brother and sister, I am from Zimbabwe, and we are near neighbors, uh, as you will know, check your map. And then, of course, joining us from the German capital, and I'm very excited about this, is because we have some MEP, some parliaments uh, from the German capital. Uh, Deborah During is with us, and Dr. Christoph Hoffmann, uh, if you could also wave. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there is a film uh, that has been released in coordination with our partners from the Human Rights Film Festival in Berlin. And I'm going to ask many of you in the audience might have already seen the film, but I'm going to ask our technical team now, my colleagues in the technical department, to present uh, just a short trailer for us to be able to see. This is the ants and the grasshopper for our conversation today. So let's have that film come on, the trailer for the ants and the grasshopper. Nina Shawatangwa Lich. Ngwambis Gavanyane. Nupang. Is it your video? I'm a widow. I'm going SFHC, I got the party at the E, Nikilai, 
chifwa cha ukaliro wa nyitu wa kuwalo e wa mere badangolito tikumindera mtu kushikaya kwake tumbiskana naye kabomezga yayi ngala nge nkuruta god said you can increase like sand, but he never <laughs> said Poiro, the atmosphere. I don't see it as an issue. That's my problem. How are you seeing the climate affecting your family? We see it more as a political agenda. It would take a global catastrophe to do a complete 180. <laughs> When you are with the Vichy, when that will be. When he is such a Gomez or Tinach, Bali Nyerel is not. When you need to talk to Gunyamura Panana. So that is a, a quick trailer uh, teaser for you, for those who have not seen the film. I know that um, for those of you who did, the link is still available and I'm sure you can still watch the film in its entirety. Uh, those of you with a sharp eye might have noticed that uh, Esther is one of the protagonists uh, in the film and I'm happy and pleased to say that she is joining us uh, today in this discussion. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it would be very selfish of me to do all of the asking of the questions. I'd like to invite you all uh, to be able to take part in this panel discussion. Uh, one of the things about the virtual platform is we're able to join from different parts of the world, but also you're able add your voice uh, to the conversation. So if you are joining us via the live stream, if you've registered and you're joining us by the live stream page, uh, there is a chat box uh, on the right hand of your screen, I think it is. You can use that to get questions over. Those questions will make themselves make their way to me and I will present them to the audience. To our uh, participants joining us uh, via Twitter and YouTube, um, we are sending you a link uh, if you use that link, you're able to get your questions as, as well. But without taking any more time, let's get into the conversation um, of the day. And I want to begin with just collecting some opening statements um, from our panelists. We've just seen that trailer. And Esther, I do want to begin uh, with you. Uh, Esther is, uh, of course, the executive director of Soils, uh, Food and Healthy Communities uh, Organization in Malawi. Mike Kunga is a uh, Sun Youth Leader uh, for Nutrition. He's also in Malawi. Deborah During is a member of the German Parliament for the Green uh, Party, uh, one of the uh, parties in the coalition government uh, in Germany. And Dr. Christoph Hoffmann, also a member of the German Parliament. He is spokesman on the development uh, cooperation uh, for the Free Democrats, also a coalition partner in Germany's new government. Back to the main question and the opening statements, um, Esther, just looking uh, at that trailer, of course, you, you were on this journey that's captured in this film. Uh, tell us about your key takeaways from that and what do you think from where you sit is the biggest barrier for us uh, to end zero or to reach zero hunger? Uh, by the year 2030. Esther? Yeah, for me, I perceive political inaction. Uh, the fact that the global, the global North is not doing enough, they don't consider people in the global South. Political inaction. Yes. Esther, perhaps if you could also tell us a little bit about the situation as you are experiencing it. You are talking from the global south. You've talked about people, global north, not doing anything. Can you give our audience today just a real sense of what the situation is like uh, for the communities that you live and work in 
in Malawi? How are people being impacted and affected? Yeah, how people are infected is uh, the, during the past, everyone was ready to say in the month of October, we have finished preparing our gardens. In the month of November, it is the time when people start planting and December, the maize is growing. And during Christmas, we have maize, which is really grown. And at the moment, this is not what people are experiencing. As I'm talking now, it is very hot. And the heat that we have is the heat which, which was supposed to be in October and September or August. But now it is very different. The rains have not come. We have not yet planted. It means we are going to face lots of problems. If the rains start coming, they come so heavy and with the heavy storm and grow off people's roofs. And sometimes they even cause a lot of floods and people become homeless. As a result, as of now, in the month of January, February, people could be saying, we'll start picking some green maize from the gardens. But as of now, no, because we haven't planted. This is because of climate change. The climate change, which I feel is caused due to mankind. That's right. So, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, a real example there of how climate change is taking food off of the table for people uh, in, in places like where Esther joins us from today, Malawi, uh, for, for, for context that's right down uh, in Southern Africa today. Mike, you're also in Malawi. What are your initial takeaways having seen that trailer? Um, and what do you say? Esther says it's political in inaction, but what is the barrier to us achieving zero hunger by 2030? Thanks so much, uh, Christine. So basically, I can't agree more with Esther. Actually, what she has raised up are very critical points, uh, especially on the examples of uh, looking from the past and now what we are facing in our countries. So basically, the huge barrier which I see from my side, uh, aside from what Esther said, is the political will and maybe the initiative to, uh, to do the awareness in the communities. For instance, Esther brought a very good point in terms of uh, how the Global North is not uh, showing interest uh, to deal with climate issues. We also look at in terms of our, how our policies have been aligned with climate change. In the past, I think uh, our policies were not probably envisioning there are gonna be a lot of climate issues, but now we are facing these climate uh, challenges. We need basically to align our policies with that. And aside from that, there are some agricultural practices or uh, interventions that maybe the community needs for, for instance, of regenerative, regenerative agriculture, climate agriculture. These are key, key things, which from my understanding, I think they need a lot of investments. So basically, if we can have more funding towards these initiatives and the aligning our policies to uh, uh, changes, global changes, then probably we'll be seeing better future or better Malawi. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So, so a call there for investment for more sustainable agricultural techniques. Thank you so much for that. Um, Honorable Deborah During, if I can call you that, if I can, if you will allow me the privilege, um, I know that you have debuted uh, in the German parliament and it's exciting for the world to look at a parliament, uh, a German parliament that has more representation, uh, young faces like yourself, hoping that you can bring in a fresh perspective to the way things have been done. I wondered if you saw the same thing I noticed as you looked at that trailer, just the disconnect with what people in your part of the world uh, are feeling when it comes to climate change versus what people, uh, my people virtually, Mike and Esther are experiencing where they are. Just your takeaways, what is your highlight having seen that trailer? And what would you say? Perhaps how would you respond uh, to, to what you have heard from Esther and Mike about the political inaction and the fact that policies have not been aligned? 
Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I think one of the points that um, still are in my mind um, is the connection of women in the fight against hunger and strong women fighting um, for their life, uh, fighting against the climate crisis. And for me, this was a really strong signal. And I think on this point of view, for example, I am really glad that my party um, elected me to be the spokesperson for the so-called development policy for the Green Party for the next four years. Um, because I think it's actually a signal, a young woman that has a clear decolonial intersectional perspective on the so-called development policy. And I think um, that this point um, empowered myself to, um, yeah, to be an ally for the people in the global north and that we as a woman have um, to fight together. And I'm really happy that we are discussing what is the reality for many people in the global south, namely they really want their livelihood, their health and their food security, and that is posed by the domestic climate. And the main cause for hunger and malnutrition in the world are not the single issues or barriers. On the one hand, we have the consequences of the climate crisis and armed conflict. And on the other hand, the social, economic and political power inequalities in the global economy and trade system that affect our food security. And on a global level, I think we need a transformation of our patterns of production and consumption. This means we need fair economic relations that promote local value chains and markets instead of hindering them. It also means that we need fair wages and decent working conditions for agricultural workers. And in many cases, our trade relation or the European agriculture policy within the EU with the subsidies destroys the local food production and the markets that development cooperation is trying to support. But in order to achieve global food security, we need also a new agriculture model, a transition the agro-industrial model to an agro-ecological. More food for a growing population because we don't have a lack of food in the world, but we have an extremely unequal distribution and I think that's one really important point and it's our responsibility as persons as politicians to be aware of that to be aware of post-colonial structures that are still have a huge power in the world and we have to break them we have to be to change our way of thinking our way of economy and our way of um, destroying the local markets and the global stars. Thank you so much uh, for that. And it, we're already hearing um, really from you, just in terms of the shift in thinking. Um, I, I will point out, although young people are in the minority uh, in Europe, they are a very strong uh, minority and it's great to see uh, such representation and to hear such refreshing views. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, I do want to come to you as well. You have been in this conversation uh, for a very long time. As you watched uh, that trailer, what did you think? Um, and perhaps what would you say are the biggest impediments to us achieving zero hunger by 2030? really like the movie because it's, it brings it down to the production of food uh, on two continents, if you want so. And it, it is really nice to, see, to um, have the, um, the meetings between those two worlds. So it's fascinating. So it's a really nice movie and it's emotional. Um, but we have to look at it. I mean, even in southern Germany, we had a in uh, um, 2018. So the maize harvest was very low here as well. So climate changes impacts are all over the world. So this is not a local problem, this is a global problem. And we have to work on this problem very hard and very fast. Otherwise we step into more hunger in most world. And I mean, all these areas in the world where human is at the edge anyway, will be suffering the most like in the Zahir region, uh, that was always very hard for 
mankind to survive, and it will be even harder. So we have to work on this to get an environment where um, yeah, mankind can survive. And your question about the biggest barrier in reaching zero hunger by 2030, we have to look at the causes of hunger. And the number one cause of hunger are military conflicts and civil wars. This is number one. And we have to address this by having more initiatives in peace funding, mediation, and avoiding conflicts. And conflicts often result out of poverty. I mean, if you have poverty, then the conflict starts. So this is a vicious cycle. And we have to interrupt this cycle. I think we can address this in the German parliament, and we will do so. I mean, we have now good friends from the Greens and the Social Democrats, and they have a very likely thinking. So um, I'm very optimistic that we can contribute to the, the zero hunger in 2030. And I'll, I'm still optimistic we can achieve it if you really want it. That's a very interesting point. Thank you so much uh, for that. And, and that really does it for that collection round uh, in terms of these opening statements. Um, I do, I, I find this conversation very interesting. Um, Dr. Hoffman, you were just off on the note of what really causes um, uh, hunger and, and you talked about the conflicts and the civil war. Um, and perhaps we could also see it uh, the other way that these conflicts and, and, and civil wars are, are being caused uh, by hunger, as we heard it, as the latest global hunger uh, index was was announced, um, we know that in Africa right now, communities that have coexisted together um, are now fighting over the scarcity of resources like water. So we see a different pattern there, where it's actually the lack of resources, um, the lack of food, essentially hunger, causing people. To fight, so I guess we're, we're finding ourselves in, in a bit of a vicious cycle um, over there. But let's use uh, the next few moments as well to, to get further into that conversation. And thank you so much um, for those initial remarks and observations. Um, and yes, uh, MEP Dur uh, MP uh, During, I do wanted to point out that your observation about women was absolutely right. I'll say something to you across Africa. If you look at our farms and on our fields, it is African women you will see tilling the soil. And so it only makes sense that they are at the forefront in terms of bringing us uh, to a solution. Uh, I just wanted to praise our women on the continent for their industriousness. Uh, and it makes me really happy the lead and, and opening up this conversation and taking the message to the different parts of the world. We saw you engaging with people uh, in the United States, people who have a very different experience to you. We're looking at a world, um, Esther, where there are so many other issues that um, global politicians um, have to consider. Uh, isn't always at the top of the agenda. You have two M uh, MPs here today from the German parliament. What would be your message to them about keeping hunger at the top of the political agenda, Esther? I just, I just remember to, to unmute yourself. I think you, what I can tell the two German MPs is to learn from what we did. And for them to learn, it's just a matter of taking the, watching the whole film of the ants and the grasshoppers. What they will see here will give them a message which they can deliver to the parliament. You have seen a very dry stream. People are digging water from there. So if people are digging water to drink from sand, what about the food? It means there is no food. There is no water to water the food, which means these people will be suffering. So what I can say is um, people in German, they have all what they need. They have everything everything, water, food, whatever they have. So on their agenda, they should try and say, how can we help these people who went all the way to America to have this film taken, ants and grasshoppers, how can we help them? So they can either, they, unfortunately there is COVID, but if there was no COVID, 
two members of parliament could have come and see what Soilo's food and health communities is doing in agroecology. And from there, they could take that message and deliver to the parliament to say, let us stop these fancy, expensive, whatever they are doing and work with the vulnerable people in Malawi. One of the things that we have is people work very hard. People are very committed, but the resources are limited. There are some people who can say, oh no, the resources are there. Yes, they are here, but they are very limited to the villages in vulnerable communities. As a result, there is always malnutrition, there is hunger, there is water shortage and all those things. But we have very good knowledge. We can transform if we have the resources. We don't want to beg, but to give to, to use the resources in a way that we can perform. If this, um, the issue of uh, increasing global warming and all that can be eradicated, then we can be much better. If we can have enough rain all the time, then it means we are going to work in our fields and then people will have enough food. But still, we need people to, to, to support. Thank you uh, for that, Esther. Technology of agroecology. But these very high advanced technologies, which people are used to do in countries like Germany or North, those cause a lot of global warming. So if we can work together, continue, then we are going to be fine. Okay, working uh, together. And that will really come, um, will be a welcomed message because we are seeking as Africa and Europe, the neighboring continents to, for partnership, working together. So thank you for bringing us to that conciliatory um, uh, solution there. Mike, I would like for you to come back on, um, if you will, or perhaps we've lost one of our panelists at this time. Uh, I will in fact come to you, um, Ms. Doring. Um, we've heard about the call uh, for resources here, that resources are needed uh, to be able to to assist um, in this uh, in this uh, situation, we are talking about Germany being a very big donor when it comes to uh, aid. We're talking about humanitarian efforts. I have a question for you pertaining to what you think Germany's contribution could be. What could Germany's contribution be in this sense? Uh, you've heard about the call for resources that are needed. Well, I think, um, first, thank you for um, the speeches before, because I think working together is a really important point and learning from, from the Global South is, I think, the key, actually. And there was what I mentioned before, that we have to change our thinking, that we have to change um, 500 years of colonial structures um, and that's a long way to go, I think. And I wanted to add one point um, on my colleague, because I think avoiding conflict is a really important point. And, but we know at the end that the speculation with food, for example, is one reason for conflicts. And we now um, have the question of speculation with water on the global markets. And I mean, if there's no water, then, we don't have, we won't have food and um, avoiding conflict also means to be really sensible with speculation objects like food or like the resource of water. And I think um, that's also the question you mentioned. I don't know if I got it right because my internet connection wasn't good. So maybe you can repeat it once again and then I can answer it. Yes, in fact, I'd like to follow that up uh, with the question around, um, we know that Germany's uh, new government has prioritized um, hunger. Uh, we know that that's definitely, it, 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 the fight against hunger, excuse me. It's one of the priorities uh, for the new German government, which includes 
uh, your party, the Greens. Um, what exactly can we expect uh, from the governing parties in the next four years uh, in light of the steep challenge specifically of climate-induced hunger? Well, thank you for repeating it. Um... I think if we not address the climate crisis, we will not be able to solve the hunger issue. Point. The climate crisis is the pressing challenge of our time. It is like this and we don't have time to lose here. And as a coalition, we want to put Jeremy on the 1.5 degree pass after years of hesitation. And we are placing climate protection as a cross-cutting task at the center of our action because it's not the job of one ministry, it's the job of everybody and all the political actors. And we are focusing on climate justice, particularly in our cooperation with the Global South. But there, um, we have to be careful not to reproduce post-colonial structures. We have to break them. And I think the climate crisis maybe is one chance or the fight against the climate crisis to do that. And on the other hand, we are also committing additional financial resource. We must keep our promise in international climate financing, but on a decolonial level. And we are miles away from the goal of ending hunger, really miles. And this is more than bitter. And the right to food is a human right. And we as a global community simply do not manage to fulfill it. And we also have to look at ourselves. For example, we are fulfilling climate change with our way of life and our way of doing business, like our, I mean, the global north. And the failure to break down this polar power imbalance between the agriculture industry and the small producer is preventing an agriculture turnaround and sustainable solution and fight against hunger. So I think it's actually the job of the new coalition to fight with all that we can the climate crisis and to change our way of thinking and our way of um, doing politics. And I know it's, it's a vision and I know that's not, it's not easy to do it, um, but you mentioned it before, I'm young and I'm now new in the parliament and I want to change politics. I want to change um, the, the imbalance um, between the global in the global south and um, if we are fighting for that together then I hope we can change this. Well absolutely welcome words there thank you so much for that. Dr Hoffman I do want to come uh, to you now. Um, how, how can the new government which includes your party the FDP speed up its game to achieve a sustainable world free from hunger. You've long been in the opposition uh, as the FDP. You now have an opportunity. How will you be spearheading this topic uh, to get us to a world free from hunger? We must note, of course, that Germany is one of the bigger players on the international stage when it comes to prioritizing a world free from hunger. But I'm sure there is acknowledgement that more can be done. And on, on what you've heard today, can you tell us about a little bit about how this new German government can weigh in to get us to a world of zero hunger. As I said in the beginning, uh, the military conflicts and civil wars are causing hunger. So we see it in Yemen, we see it in Afghanistan, we see it in uh, several other places. We have to um, build up peace building capacities. This is number one, I think, uh, to avoid these conflicts. Number two is the COVID crisis, as you said, has been throwing back the development and has been throwing back also the fight against hunger. So we have to overcome this COVID crisis and uh, because it was an economic downturn and we have to open up again the supply chain to uh, create income. Number three is uh, the, the climate crisis. It's getting more and more important. Every year it gets warmer, so it's getting more and more important. And uh, it, Number, now it's maybe number three cause of uh, hunger, but it'll, it'll step up every year. So we have to fight uh, the climate crisis. And I, I can give you two examples where the German government, the, the old government, didn't really fulfill um, the expectations and did some mistakes. Like peace building mediation. We had a conflict in Cameroon 
I tried to convince Chancellor Merkel to go there and try to mediate the conflict. She didn't go. So this is something we have to um, put more into um, in, into the political options that our leaders go into those places to mediate. Because Germany has a good reputation of being rather neutral, and so they can play a role. But we have to step in and, and do it. And number two, like uh, this was, has something to do with uh, nutrition as well. There was this locust crisis in East Africa, and there was predictions of these locusts coming up from the uh, Food and Agricultural Organization. And we called the government to step in and spend some money um, to spray the, the beginning of this catastrophe. And uh, but the, the reaction was very, very slow and too slow to stop it from the beginning because in, in these kind of developments. When when you have insects multiplying themselves, you have to step in the beginning. So this is something we have to change. We have to have a much faster reaction on these problems. This is on the conflicts and on the catastrophes. This is the thing. And then in the long run, of course, we have to build up and um, support projects like, like from the African Union, the Great Green Wall, which is a superb project. It's the world's greatest project. Uh, to improve the livelihood of people and save the arable land in these areas where nutrition is scarce. Um, so we have to support the Great Green Wall and the African Union more than we did before. And we need this technical transfer um, to integrate the farming in Africa. I mean, the population is growing in Africa. We need more food there. And at this point, we have sort of a sustainable little farming. And this is not enough. We have to improve that. And this is plant breeding, seed improvement, uh, and stockage, so the food won't go rotten. And it needs also transportation and infrastructure um, to save more food because a lot of food rots. So this is, I think, these points are very important. I'd like it more practical rather than a philosophy about uh, things to come. So I think practical within the four years we can uh, address these problems. Understood, and 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 really we are getting these are real tangible things that you're saying. Um, and that is very refreshing, um, Dr. Hoffman, to get some tangibles. It's not always um, a given, especially among politicians. Um, I find it interesting. We reported a lot. Um, I work for the Deutsche Welle uh, news outlet. Um, that's Germany's international broadcaster. And we reported uh, a lot on, on, on the locusts uh, that you were referring to that ravaged uh, East Africa, and it's really interesting for me to hear that this uh, could have been averted, that that more could have been done to avoid that level of devastation had there just been more political will um, within Germany. That's interesting. Thank you so much for that. Mike, uh, you're back on, uh, and it, we're glad to see you back on. Um, well, you, you, you could hear some of the, the, the suggestions and, and, and some of the things that we heard from Dr. Hoffman about what a new German government could be doing. Um, but before you had left, Esther was also talking about the need uh, for resources, and you also talked about investment in your opening statement. Um, what is it that a government like Germany's government could do uh, to assist um, in terms of getting us to a world of zero hunger by 2030 or, or sooner rather than later? Tell us a little bit about what Germany could do. Unmute yourself and, and go ahead, Mike. Right. Thanks so much, uh, Christine, and apologies for, for the bad connection. But I hope you can hear me right now. So basically, building from the conversation, uh, investing in uh, climate smart agriculture will be key, as I already said by colleagues. But also the other thing which I want to highlight right now is uh, investment in future generations, which is the young people. So basically, as we, uh, my advice, of course, as the German we are discussing uh, policy issues in parliament, let us take a look at how best we can invest in young people who are already engaged in agriculture. During the UN Food System Summit, I remember we raised a very huge point as the youth are engaged in Food System Summit. That is, make sure that young people who are already working in food systems, they are given the opportunity and uh, the capacity, but as, as well as their working, working environment is improved. So if we can take up these issues uh, in German parliament, it will be key uh, in many of our countries because we want to make sure that young people champion agriculture. We want to make sure that young people champion initiative 
that will promote food as well as nature climate. Aside from that, uh, let me also emphasize that uh, if we can, if we can have various uh, interventions which can be intervened, talk of gender, talk of social resilience, and even life with program change as well as food. Uh, as food. Right. Uh, we appear to be having some uh, difficulty uh, with where Mike is. Um, I'm sure that when he is able to. OK, uh, thanks for that, Mike. We are having some difficulty with your connection. Um, perhaps as I deal with the other uh, panelists, you might just want to see what you're able to do. We can see you, first, um, but we were not able to hear uh, the last bit of what you said. So uh, that's Mike over there, the view. Uh, from Mike, I do have some audience questions uh, coming in here as well, um, and perhaps I will throw them up. Pertains to what German youth can do. Of course, Mike, who was just talking, is a youth leader uh, in Malawi. Um, Deborah, what can German youth, um, or how can German youth be involved uh, when it comes to the policy making uh, of the German Parliament? Uh, that's a, a position that you you find yourself in. Uh, somebody in the audience, I, I guess, is looking for the, for the reassurance that, that you can impact and, and have an, um, a say when it comes to the policy making of, of the German parliament. Well, I actually think that the youth um, did a lot um, for um, the last few years of changing political minds. I mean, there were a lot of young people on the streets every Friday, and they actually focused the climate crisis. And with their help now, or yeah, they, they put it in, in the middle of the discourse. They told us that we can't um, solve this problem with only talking about it, that we have to really act now. And I think the, the strangeness of the youth, not only in Germany, worldwide, is that if we work together, if we are loud, if we are really, really loud all the time and put our power on the street, um, then we, we can start to change the thinking of the people everywhere in the parliament, but all over, um, our institutions and all that. So I think the strength of the use is that we have a vision that our life that um, will be influenced by the decisions that are made today. And often people tell us that they are parents um, and they want to change the world for their children. And I think that's a really, really important point because if we are talking about the climate crisis, I mean, my generation, our generation, will have to deal with the consequences if we don't do anything now. I mean, and you, you see it everywhere in the world that the climate crisis has a huge influence on the world. And on the other point, you see that in the global north, the influences are not as big as in the global south, how you also uh, saw it in the film. So I think if we as young people together with everybody are going on the street if we are fighting every day in it doesn't depend on the street on the kitchen table um in our schools or in the parliaments for a better world then we really can change um the way we are producing things the way how we're thinking um how we're debating um all those points so I think the use is a really, really important point, but not only the use. I mean, we need everybody to focus on the climate crisis. So um, we are maybe really loud, but we need the support um, from everybody in the parliament and over the parliament. Thank you for that. Esther, I have a question here from the audience that I would like to have you answer. Somebody is pointing out 
uh, that in the film, uh, the film that we watched, the, the trailer that we saw, um, that um, you had um, some, you, as a protagonist, you had a lot of knowledge of how to combine crops in the best possible way. Um, and the question is, do you think that countries like Germany could learn something uh, from agricultural practices that we have uh, in Africa, in Malawi, where you are, do you think that you would, might be able to teach people in Germany uh, some agricultural practices that you have in Malawi? Yes, uh, I think if that one is a big yes. We can teach agriculture practices like agroecology. And when we are doing agroecology, we can also, people can also use indigenous seeds. The seeds which are not all hybrid, the seeds which in the communities, some of them people can reuse. And uh, again, in German people or in the global north, when we went there, we saw big fields of maize and uh, soya beans different, but if they can uh, uh, intercrop them, you improve soil fertility. There is also a lot of uh, conserving soil moisture and the crops grow very well. If you use those technologies, it means you are going to use less of chemical fertilizers. The chemical fertilizers, which when you are producing and when you are uh, applying them over the air, you pollute a lot of air. So that's why I'm saying, if you can only reduce your emissions, it can work very well. Then you do agroecology. Doing agroecology, you are going to see that you are going to work with the um, people from the south who are very vulnerable. And then when you are working, you see that you should do climate change adopt, uh, adaptation for a global south where the impact is felt strongly. So if you feel the impact, of what we have here in the South, you are going to say, let us work with them. So the issue is, it doesn't only mean the people from the global and learn from what the global, uh, global North to global South, but also people from global South can go and see what happening in German. The same as what happened in this film, after someone, was argued for a long time. Later on, he came back and said, I have understood why you are suffering with the impact of climate change. Now it means those particular people we met have changed and things are going to improve. So people in German can also improve if they see how we do agroecology. Even when they are pests, and diseases in the fields. We are using local helps, but we don't spray everything. Whatever you spray in the fields and the like, those are the ones which really spoil the air and the environment. At the end of the day, the global south receive the effects of the issues which are done in the global north. Thank you so much. In fact, I want to pick up uh, on one of the things that you said, and I'm hoping that Mike uh, can come on and, and tackle uh, a question from the audience uh, pertaining to the health of soil um, and how that is important uh, in terms of us uh, being able to secure food for everybody and eliminating hunger. Mike, if you are there, please turn on your video and let's talk a little bit about the, the what actions are being done in this when it comes to protecting our soil. Okay, I think we've lost him for the moment. As soon as he's back, I'll activate him uh, on that. But soil protection, perhaps Dr. Hoffman, I'll bring this one uh, to you. Uh, I know you've listed a number of, uh, uh, um, in terms of steps that the government will be taking, but the health of soil uh, is also very important. Is that something that you've encountered uh, as you have been addressing this hunger topic? Is, are there any actions pertaining to soil health, um, that you could perhaps address the question, is anything being done in this, in, in this direction? Because as somebody in the audience rightly uh, points out, we need to protect soil 
in order to combat hunger. Uh, you are on mute, Dr. Hoffman. Yeah, it's very important to protect uh, soil and have programs where soil is protected. Um, but um, we have, as I mentioned before, we have this uh, great project for the African Union, Great Green Wall, which is more or less protection of soil and uh, improving life of people by covering the land with a little um, shadow so the uh, temperature on the ground is not as high as it is. So it lowers the temperature, so agriculture more be possible and things like that are important. But to mention one more thing, uh, protection of soil is also protecting forests. And like uh, we are the, the world, forests, the big forest blocks of Amazon or the Congo Basin, this is the, the air condition of the world. And we have to protect the remaining forests of this world. We're losing about 7 million hectares a year. This is a very important topic in, in, in saving the climate. And by reforestation, we can uh, have a, a really impact. Um, like there is a lot of devastated um, original forests in Indonesia, for instance, uh, where we can reforest like uh, hundreds of millions of hectares, which could lower the temperature and give us a little more time by changing the industry and all that. And um, regarding the question of Esther and um, uh, of the agroecology agro um, of the farming, Europe went through this. Uh, the European agriculture until 1800 was nothing but uh, ecological. So everything which was used was brought back to the fields. But then there was hunger in Europe and people emigrated to the United States. All Ireland was sort of going to the United States because there was no food. And then there was a technical improvement of the artificial fertilizer in 1840, which solved the problem. And at that time, people thought we could, the world could only habitate all, about 2 billion people. Now we are 8 billion people and we can still feed them. This is of techno technology and improvement of seeds. So don't, we don't have to um, abolish that. We have to work on this and get more progress with less energy into it. The problem now is we have uh, much too much energy consumption of carbon. So we have to get out of these fossil fuels. And this is going to be a tricky question when it comes um, to the global south, because Nigeria, for instance, has huge gas fields and they want to exploit it which makes the climate crisis worse. So to find right balance is very difficult and will be challenging during the upcoming years. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Esther, if you would like to respond to that, um, let me know if you would like to respond to that. You could give me a, a thumbs up uh, if you would like to respond to uh, Dr. Hoffman there. Uh, I didn't hear properly. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, don't worry, don't about, worry that. about that. Perhaps I'll actually, I'll actually just move on uh, with the conversation here because I do have a lot of audience questions coming in and, and I'm watching the clock, ladies and gentlemen, please forgive me, uh, but we won't be able to accommodate all the questions. I'll ask my panelists to, to keep it sharp and short now as we as we go on in, in the conversation. Here's one, um, and I, I wanna bring that to you, uh, Deborah, because uh, there is a, a, a suggestion here. Somebody in the audience is pointing out that France implemented a successful law on food waste donations for supermarkets uh, in 2016. But the audience member is pointing out that the share of food waste due to agriculture and distribution have higher percentages. Um, what can Germany do to reduce the industrial food waste? You made the point, uh, Ms. During, that there is enough food, it's just the issue of distribution uh, is, is the problem. So perhaps what would Germany do in this regard to reduce the amount of food going to waste? Well, um, thank you for the question or the suggestion. I think one really important point is, sure, on the national level, we have um, 
to think about ideas how we can reduce food waste and I think there's a lot to do but I think on the global level actually the more important point is that at the moment the resource food you can it's like you can do speculation with it and that was the point I pointed out before the question of conflict if we speculate with food, if we speculate with water in the international finance market, then we won't get to the point that there will be enough food for, for everybody. But because it's an, it, the problem is not that there is no food. The problem is that in some countries, there's a lot of food. And in other countries, there's not enough food for everybody. So I think we have to talk in a global perspective more at the one point to search um, for solutions um, with the persons who are living there, how we can support them and their food production. And on the other hand, we have to reflect the international finance market and their influence um, with, for example, speculations um, for the food security. Thank you so much for that. Um, we are, of course, uh, three minutes uh, to running the clock. Um, and I, I do would like, want you to all think about your, your closing statements. Um, I've been taking notes as we've been engaged in this conversation. And I do believe uh, that while we don't necessarily agree on, on every single step, I think what we agree on is that we are partners in this fight against eradicating hunger. Germany has been a leader uh, on this front and, and we continue to look to to, to your leadership. Um, it also ties into a question that somebody is, is pointing out that there was a G7 summit that was held uh, in, in, in Germany back in 2015 um, and, and, and uh, fighting hunger, addressing the climate crisis was a big part of that. Uh, there was even a commitment to lift 500 million people um, out of poverty. And somebody is asking in the audience, how do we make sure that this promise is not in the international on the international agenda. So, as you do your closing statements, specifically Dr. Hoffman and, and Ms. During, please um, reassure our audience about the commitment that you are making uh, as members of the of, of the German uh, government here today. Exactly in terms of what you will be doing uh, on that front. And let's hear your closing remarks now. And I guess we'll go in this order. Uh, Dr. Hoffman will come to you, uh, Ms. During, and then we'll close off with you. Esther in Malawi, if Mike comes on, I'll also create an opportunity for him. Uh, 20 seconds and not more for each of you, please. <laughs> uh, we have to stop the climate crisis by decarbonizing and um, try to challenge it with new technology to have renewable energy from on, in Africa. So this might be a solution to us all and gives us more income into Africa. And if you have income, you can buy food. Thank you so much for that, Ms. During. We have to change our thinking at all, um, how we act, um, how we reproduce those post-colonial power structures. And I think um, we have to be an ally um, for the people who are fighting day to day against the climate crisis in the global south and do whatever we can um, to fulfill the goal. And um, one last comment on all the international conferences we had, for example, um, the last COP, and there we saw what global injustice is, that persons from the global south couldn't be part of it. They are not heard in the global discussion and it's our role to support that, to be allies of the people of the Global South, that they can speak, they can tell us um, their point of views, and we have to learn from them and their perspective. So I'm really happy to be here, or thank you for the invitation. Um, it was an honor um, to talk to you, and I hope we will see us soon. Thank you very much uh, for that, Ms. During. Um, Esther, if you could please come on in with your 20 second as a, of closing remarks. Uh, don't forget to unmute yourself.
going to say, like it was said in the COP, that the IPCC told us how much need to be reduced in the next decade to avoid the West. And the, tell the countries like Germany, the global north, to invest much more in climate change adaptation for the global south. And again, this is because it is where the impact is strongly felt and support agroecology done by local organization where a lot of evidence of positive impact have been shown. So to local organization, not only are energy very high government level, but also go to the local organization. Like my colleague was talking about the youth organization. So also to the local organization like Soilers Food and Health Organization, SFHC, and many other who are there. Thank you very much for inviting me to join this discussion. Thank you very much. And of course, uh, to the ladies and gentlemen that have uh, joined us as participants, thank you so much for taking part in this conversation for, for the questions that you have helped, uh, to, that have helped to move our conversation uh, forward. Just a final thank you uh, to the organizers of this event, to the makers uh, of the film, and of course, the, the partners that have made uh, this debate and event possible. To my panelists as well, um, Dr. Hoffman, Esther, Deborah, uh, as well as Mike, uh, thank you so much for the contributions that you've made. You, you helped us take this conversation further. Uh, and I'm looking forward to us coming again together because every effort is needed if we're going to achieve our goal of uh, bringing zero hunger to the world. It is possible, we have enough for everybody, but we need to of course coordinate our efforts and take real action. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, that does it for our debate today. I wish you all a wonderful evening, wherever you are. Thank you very much and goodbye. <laughs>